Tsunade and Aisu stood a few feet away, eyeing one another. The Anbu and Bolt were behind Tsunade, who was aware of everyone and every movement around her. Captain, take your squad and protect the citizens of this village. Also, eliminate the enemy threat. All villages that are not allied to us are to be taken out immediately. Get as far away from here as possible. You might get killed if you get caught up in this, Tsunade ordered her Anbu squads. Never taking his eyes off of Tsunade, Aisu spoke to his squad. She's right, you all might want to get far away from here. However, take out all the enemy ninja in the process. You have your orders. Move out. The Bolt Squad moved out. Tsunade wondered why her squad didn't move and she realized that it was because it was Yugito's squad and she was worrying about Senjuru. Look Captain, don't worry about your fellow Leaf Ninja trapping that barrier. He'll be fine. Just worry about everyone else. Yugito nodded and raised her hand to the squad behind her. Everyone, move out. The Anbu disappeared from view. Aisu popped his neck. Finally, they're gone. Now we can have some fun without anyone interfering. He turned to Senjuru. You might want to convince her to concede and let the Leaf Village fall under my jurisdiction. Senjuru narrowed his eyes. I would never do that. Where do you think I got my hard head from? I guess my son gave you my answer, though Kage said with a proud smirk. Aisu shook his head. Can't say I didn't try. No matter. I will end this now. Whenever you're ready, Shinada gave him the green light to attack. The two glared at one another as their power began to rise. In the stands, Kakashi flipped over a ninja and planted a knife in his neck. When he landed, he performed a 180 turn, avoiding a kunai piercing his neck. He then placed a kunai in the back of the neck of his attacker. Guy placed a kick in the stomach of one man, sending him flying. The other attacker tried to sneak up behind him, but a strong backhand fist stopped him completely. Kakashi and Guy were back to back. The spandex-clad Jonin smiled. So, how many, Kakashi? Eight. You? He asked. You outdo me once again, my rival, Kakashi. I only have six, Guy said. Kakashi looked at the incoming shinobi. No time for that. We have business to take care of. Let's go. Yes, the two Jonin vanished from the view of a number of rain, cloud, mist, and rock shinobi. Makanu and the others reached Akuru and Yasumi. Both girls were avoiding battle. This was due to Anko's orders. He grabbed Akuru's hands. We have to find Konohamaru and aid him in helping the civilians get to safety. Anko landed next to the kids and performed a fire release that burned all the shinobi in her path. She looked back. What the hell are you guys doing here? It doesn't matter. Stay down, okay? Ranpu spoke. We can't do that. We were assigned a mission by Shikamaru. Tenzu used one of his wood clones to pierce the shinobi coming up from his blind side. He then landed on the wood sticking out of the ground. Shikamaru gave you a mission? Well then get going. A Jonin has ordered you. Just be careful and watch each other's back. This isn't a simulation. It's the real thing. Anko saw that Shikamaru was surrounded. She leaped forward, propelling herself to the front of the stadium seat, scoring a kick on a shinobi who jumped onto the rail, only to land flat on his back on the exam's battle stage. When she landed, she used dual snake hands to bite the shinobi attacking from both sides, causing each to become paralyzed due to the venom. She turned back and yelled, Get going already! They all ran out of the stadium with Ron Poo leading the way with his Byakugan. Anko jumped into the ring appearing next to Shikamaru to provide support. Looks like you could use some help. Not really, but thanks anyway, Shikamaru said to Kanoichi. Donkey was going to enjoy this. I'm gonna have fun with you guys. Anko stepped forward. Bring it on. Anko and Shikamaru were attacked by Daki and the others, engaging in a kunai duel to a standstill. Not too far from Kakashi and Guy, Asuma and Kurenai were taking down enemy ninjas easy enough. He glanced at Shikamaru to see if he was okay. So far, so good. He cursed Senzuru for acting on his feelings. His friend knew better. Now the Leaf couldn't use his power because of his foolishness. He didn't have time to complain. He had Shinobi to take out. Kurenai turned to Asuma. Don't worry, Shikamaru and Senjuro will be fine. We just have to get rid of these guys. Planting his knife in the stomach of one, then kicking him off, he turned to Kurenai. Easier said than done. The two continued to battle Shinobi after Shinobi, both praying for their friend's safety, outside of the village. Niall was surrounded by enemy Shinobi. One spoke. Traveling with the Yuga, I can only assume you're an ally to the Leaf. Don't worry, we'll kill her soon enough and the guy with her. It's time you die, lady. Strains of hair masked Naya's eyes. If the shinobi surrounding her could see her eyes, they would know that she was going to enjoy this. With speed and agility, Naya attacked a shinobi behind her with a punch to the stomach. She flipped over his back avoiding the kunai aimed at her, which hit the shinobi she flipped over, killing him. An earth-style javelin shot into her, but she flipped over it into the air. Once in the air, she vanished into nothing but dust. Before one could yell out, Naya was standing on his neck. 
She kicked off the ninja who hit the ground due to his broken neck, landing in a handstand position. Pushing off, she avoided the earth style used to trap her hands, landing in a crouching position next to one of the shinobi. She avoided the sword that he thrust toward her by using the shunjuin. Appearing behind him, she heard his body hit the ground as she slit his throat. A fire style jutsu came at her from behind, but she avoided it. The four remaining shinobi were searching for her location. Nai was sitting on a tree branch, swinging her legs. Come on guys, I mean I know you're better than this. I mean seriously, someone like me should be child's play to you strong men. They turned their attention to Naya, anger evident on their faces. Here they thought they would be done with her, but they were actually fighting for their lives. Naya smiled at them, she got them where she wanted them. She was in their heads. Even if she didn't get into their heads, she still would have won. These guys were weak, Junin or low Jonin at best. She would play around with them a little more, but not too much that she got careless and gave them an opportunity to capitalize. She decided to taunt them some more. So, are you guys gonna sit there all day or what? Who's brave enough to ask for a dance? One summoned a Fuma Shuriken. This caused Naya to raise an eyebrow. The said Shinopi threw the Fuma Shuriken at her with full force. Naya shin joined out of her seat, leaving the branch she was sitting on to get severed along with several other branches until it disappeared out of view. Appearing behind all of them, Naya engaged them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. One kicked at her head, but she blocked her with her arm and hit him under his leg with her free hand. She then used that hand to block an incoming punch from her left. She brought her right hand forth and struck him with an open palm. Ducking under the punch aimed at the back of her head, Naya did a leg swipe only bending down slightly with her right hand balancing her. She then did a flip off the stomach of the ninja she tripped to avoid the slash from the sword aimed at her back. Naya moved into a back handspring sequence until she was a distance away from the shinobi. She executed her plan flawlessly. The ones that she scored a hit on did not realize that she slapped a sticker with a seal on them. The only one she didn't try to get was the shinobi because she knew it would be ineffective against him. The shinobi that would hurt by her attack got off the ground. They were ready to attack, but the Miss Shinobi stepped forward uh, with his sword. You're pretty good, but we got you cornered, and you have nowhere to run. Nai brought her hands together, and all the shinobi that she made contact with fell to the ground in pain. They had no clue what was going on. Nai proceeded to explain before one typically asked what she did. Before you struggle to ask what I did, the seal that I place on you has closed off your chakra. There are two ways to cancel my chakra containment seal. One, an expert at sealing jutsus cancels it, or you have to be strong enough to the point where you can cancel it yourself. Jonin can cancel it with these, some Chunin can, and well, I'm sure there are a few Genin, but a very small number. I guess you guys know where you stand as far as your power level. The mission of you spoke. So, why didn't you put it on me? I know it's because I'm your equal and such a technique wouldn't work on me. Naya shook her head. That's not it. I'll admit it. It wouldn't work on you, but I knew that off the bat. However, we aren't on the same level at all. The fact of the matter is, you are weaker than I. Knowing that such as a seal wouldn't work on you is why I had something else in mind for you. Naya jumped up to the high branch and looked down at him with a smile. The Mishinobi saw the trees around him each had a weird kanji carved in them that was glowing green. The whole area turned into a green barrier. Naya addressed all the shinobi encased in the barrier. For you, I made something much stronger. He looked at her as realization dawned on him as he realized who she was. The only person he knew that was a master at the seal arts was the strongest Jonin in his village. The only other person who could utilize seals this effectively was none other than... You're the seal mistress, aren't you? Guilty as charged. I'm sorry kid, but you never really had a chance against me. You may be an excellent shinobi, but your sword skills suck. I fought with and against members of the Seven Swordsmen, the late great Minashu clan, and a slew of others. The style you're using is a watered-down version of Saichi Kaito's. I'm not going to kill you, kid. I'll be back for you after the war. Sit tight and don't touch the barrier or you'll be burnt to a crisp. Hey, why did you keep us alive and not the shinobi from the rain? The Miss Shinobi asked. She looked at the three other Miss Shinobi on the ground, then at him. Simple, you never had any intention to kill me. Your Mizukage forced you and a few others here to be a part of this. Those three shinobi attacked to kill. You attacked to injure and subdue. I guess it's the reason why you're out here with friends attacking the lady you thought you can contain this until it all blows over. Am I right? He turned away. Yes. Turning back to Naya. 
but you should have killed us. Who's to say that we won't kill you if we get free? Well, you can try, but seeing as I dispatched you for it easily, do you really want to take the chance? Besides, you don't want to kill me. I guess it's safe to say that you are among the division that supports Kaito. The shinobi put his head down. He looked back at Naya with a stern look. Lord Mizukage is scum. Lord Kaito should be the ruler of Kiri. That man is the worst of the worst. Poverty, famine, disease are all things that plague our lands. His only concern is Lord Kaito. That's why he searches for him relentlessly, but fails time and time again to find him. I never wanted to attack the Leaf. None of us did. This isn't our war. We have our own shit to deal with, but the Mizukage doesn't care for his people. Opposing him means death, so we play by his rules to survive. If what you say is true, he threw the sword in his hand to the ground. Then, you truly aren't my enemy. The Mizukage is. His friend on the ground spoke. What are you saying? You'll be executed if the Mizukage finds you're not with him. Remember the plan. Get stronger than overthrow him. Shut up. Did that work for Zabza? He was the only one of the seven swordsmen to attempt a coup. And look where it got him. He had to flee. This is the perfect opportunity to kill him now. We can usher in a new era for our village. Maybe even find a cure for my sister. The shinobi dropped to his knees. Please, let Lord Kaito win. Naya felt bad for them. Well, she just hoped that Kaito would be okay. Don't worry, I'll come back for you later. The barrier will wear off in three hours if I'm not back. Naya left the Mishinobi and was on her way to the stadium. When she got a distance away, she was surrounded again. But this time by a bunch of evil ninjas, she just sighed. Will I ever reach the stadium? She couldn't worry about that now. She had a number of ninjas to get by first. Somewhere in the woods outside of Konoha. Kaito was standing waiting. He suspected that it would only take a few minutes before the Mizukage arrived to confront him. The Leaf Slash Cloud War provided him with that opportunity. Either way it went, it would end here today between him and the Mizukage. It has been close to 13 years since he was last in Kiri, charged for a crime that he didn't commit, which was the assassination of the fourth Mizukage. When he fled, Zabza was the youngest ever to join the Seven Swordsmen at the age of 17. Whom he took under his wing was devastated when he fled two years after his joining. Zabza vowed that he would change the mist and bring him back. Two years later, Zabza himself fled the village after his failed attempt to kill Mizukage. A year before that, Kisame fled the village as well because of his association with the rebellion and the murder of corrupt members in his country. Now that he thought about it, maybe he should have fought instead of running. Or maybe he should have tried to convince the remaining swordsmen to come with him. He didn't know how that would have worked with Kisame and Raiga. Those two hated each other with a passion. But at least they would have been alive and wouldn't have pursued their own ways to gain the power to overthrow the Mizukage. He suspected that Kisame's reason for joining the Akatsuki. And he knew that Zabuza hooked up with Gato to gain the resources to form the army he would need. It was mind-boggling how someone they once called a friend, someone they once called comrade, someone they once called a member of the Seven Swordsmen betrayed them all. How could he be so blind and not see his motives? Now that he thought about it, Tara's death, the only female member of the squad, was because she figured out his motives and tried to warn him. It was only after she investigated Fugu's death four months before the Mizukage's death, when Tara was killed a few weeks before the fourth Mizukage was killed, that's when his suspicions were confirmed. Tara was onto something, and she was silenced for it. Lo and behold, weeks later, the Mizukage was murdered, and he was accused. He had no choice but to leave. All of the evidence pointed towards him committing the crime. With him, Fugu, Kisame, Raiga, Zabza, and Tara out of the way, the current Mizukage was free to do what he wanted, and with no one to stop him. Today was the day. No more running. No more hiding. It was time he confronted him to avenge Tara and Fugu's death, salvage what family life he did have, and free Miz from his tyrannical rule. He would wait, because after today, there would be only one of Miss Seven alive. Only one. In the village. Neji wasn't wasting any time taking down Shinobi after Shinobi. The fact of the matter was, there were more Shinobi than he had imagined. The leaf was overrun with enemy Shinobi. The sand was standing strong, but he saw many of the Kusa Ninja and Waterfall Ninja fall by the wayside. He couldn't worry about that though. His focus was to keep his squad and the civilians alive. Everyone on his squad was doing great. He watched as Lee took out a group of rock shinobi with Leaf's strong wind. He saw Tenten slaughter dozens of ninjas with her rising dragon. Shino was probably the last person he would worry about. 
That guy would probably be the leader if he wasn't so quiet. Ina was also doing well. She was taking care of business, point blank. Neji ducked under an attack and struck two attacking shinobi, causing them to fall dead beneath him. He spoke into the mic in his mask. Boar, what's going on? We need to clear this area so we can transport the civilians out of their houses and shops. I know, Hawk. I'm working on it. It's just, there are too many. Neji was inclined to agree. Lee, on the other hand, was enthusiastic about this whole ordeal. What are you guys talking about? This is great practice. We have a chance to show what we're made of. Wouldn't you agree, Blue Steel? Tenten was the next person Neji heard. I'm sorry, Iron Fist, but Boar is right. There are too many. No matter how many we take down, more come up. Area cleared. Civilians coming your way, Hawk. Neji wasn't surprised by Shino at all. Okay, my area is cleared. I'm just waiting on Boar, Neji informed. Ino yelled through the mic. My area is now cleared. Are you happy? Send them through, Hawk. Red Fang, what about your area? Is it cleared? Neji heard Kiva's voice next. Yeah, has been for a while. The civilians here are already safe. I sent them to Blue Butterfly, and he has escorted them to safety. We just need to clear the rest of the southern section of Kona, which is up to you guys. Compared to what's going on in the stadium, we got it easy. Neji spoke as he signaled the shooting and the getting help and the civilians to go. What do you mean? I mean, it was crazy. Gar and some bald-headed ninja from Rock are off somewhere. Senju is trapped in a barrier. Kakashi, Guy, Kurnai Sensei, and Asuma are all fighting in the arena. Shikamaru was surrounded by a bunch of shinobi last time I'd seen him in Sakura. I just got a glimpse of her rushing out of the stadium. Tsunade ordered us to leave. Had we stayed, we would have been caught up in their battle. Not to mention that we're losing a lot of shinobi. We're being overwhelmed, Kiba informed Neji. Neji didn't like what he was hearing. The enemy was advancing too quickly. The stadium was flooded, according to Kiba. Neji spoke to Yugao. Moonflower, are you there? I'm listening to you guys, but I'm busy fending off Shinobi. I assume all of you are okay if you're talking? Well, since that's the case, I suggest you all work harder to neutralize this threat ASAP. We rendezvous in 15. All of our teams, I'll be leading captain. Is that clear, Hawk? Yugao said in a more authoritative and agitated tone than usual. Understood. Neji suspected it had to do with Senju being encased in a barrier which he could now see with the activation of his Byakugan again. He was searching for his clan. The Hugas were fighting and taking down Shinobi as well. He smiled when he saw Hinata coming from the west. She would be able to provide support to them and the rest of the village. He spotted Hanabi close to Choji's area with Yumi and Hayami. He was shocked that he didn't see Mai, but now that he thought about it, he hadn't seen Yumi's mother in a while. The only people he couldn't find were Naruto and Sasuke. Where the hell was the Uchiha and Naruto? Naruto was out of the village, though he knew his reason, but Sasuke, where the hell was he at a time like this? Neji's eyes widened when he saw that cloud noise in a group of shinobi heading Hanabi's way. He yelled through his mic, Butterfly, Hanabi, Yumi, and Hayami are coming your way, and they are being tracked. Get to them, behind you. Before Choji could say anything, he was knocked unconscious. Kadon was standing over him. He returned to Kumiko. I cleared the path. Let's go and get this over with. She nodded and they moved out with the rock ninjas and rain ninjas under their control. Neji spoke. Red Fang, get the butterfly, he needs your help. Inu is now concerned for Choji, Yumi, and Hayami. Hawk, what happened? Hanabi and the others are about to be attacked. We can't leave our posts. Don't worry, Ino. Hanabi's a good shinobi. They should be okay, he said to comfort Ino. Yugao spoke once more. The faster we finish here, the faster you guys can help your friends. They all agreed it was time to give their all to help the others. On the other side of the village, Hanabi had her Byakugan active. She cursed their luck. Komoko was right on them. She turned to Konamaru. We have to buy Ron Poo and the other gang some time. He looked at Makanu. Well, I'm leaving it to you guys. Get Hayami and Yumi out of here. Makanu looked at Konohamaru. Are you gonna be okay? Konohamaru gave him a thumbs up. Of course, how will the sixth Okagi die when he hasn't even taken office yet? We'll be fine, now go on. Yumi nodded at Konohamaru. Hayami didn't want to split up. She was afraid she wouldn't see him again. Konohamaru put a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry, you have to go. Big Brother Naruto will be here any minute. And I'm sure he wants to see you and Yumi alive. I'll be okay. That girl nodded, understanding she had to go. When Konohamaru motioned for them to move and stay within the shadows, he looked at Hanabi, Moigi, Udon, and Matsuri, who they met up with while fleeing the stadium. Appearing in the middle of the road, he saw Komoko and Kadon standing in front of them, with a few shinobi from Cloud. Kadon spoke. They were the ones protecting those girls. Komoko, go after them. We'll deal with them and catch up. Sorry, but you won't be catching up with anyone. Kadon looked up to see Sasuke staring at him, from his location on the roof of a local establishment. Komoko quickly left. Sasuke didn't give her chase. Konohamaru did that. He was going to order him anyway, but the boy read his mind. However, the other shinobi with them went after him. He addressed Anabi. 
Hanabi, you and your group go after him. Stop them at all cost. Hanabi and the other group disappeared from view. Sasuke now had caught onto himself. His goal was to beat this guy and find out where Cohen was. He wanted to fight him. For some reason, Cohen had a strength about him that would test his abilities. So, where is your friend, that blue-haired ninja? I was actually looking for him. Mind telling me? Well, I don't know where Cohen is, but it doesn't matter. I'm your opponent. Maybe if you beat me, I'll tell you. When I beat you, eh? That sounds like fun. Sasuke grinned, showing his excitement. Bring it on, Sasuke Uchiha. Kodon returned the grin, showing his excitement as well. Without any words to say, Sasuke and Kodon disappeared from their spots. The battle was on, at the stadium. Shinade really didn't have anything to say to this man, which he asked. Are you sure you want to play it out like this, Aisu? Whenever you're ready, Shinade. She closed her eyes and reopened them. Very well. Shinade used a speed only displayed by a few ninjas in the world, mostly those of Kage level. Her punch aimed at Aisu's face missed by an inch. He was no fool. He knew of her power, but he figured that's all she was. He, though, he had the advantage. But when he went to kick, she blocked it to a surprise. She threw another punch, which he blocked, but the force of the punch caught him off guard and sent him a few feet back before he stopped. Wow, I really underestimated you, Sonate. He seemed to be enjoying this. Underestimating me will be your downfall, though Kage said in a fighting stance. You're right. One shouldn't underestimate a Sonin. I guess I'll be getting a decent fight here after all. Doing hand seals into speed only Tsunade and Sentry could follow. Aisu shot a stream of flames that Tsunade used to tile on the stadium as a shield. She then used them as a shuriken. Aisu avoided them by moving so fast that he was behind Tsunade. Sensing his presence, Tsunade performed a back kick, which was avoided with ease and followed up with a punch. Tsunade caught the punch. She then balled up her free hand to punch Aisu in the stomach, but being prepared, he used one foot to block the punch and planned to kick her in the chest with the other. Seeing his plan, she jumped back, releasing him. Standing five feet away, Tsunade couldn't help but notice his skill. This guy was good. His taijutsu was excellent. He knew her power and adapted and fought accordingly. Not only was his taijutsu good, so was his ninjutsu. She knew that just by seeing the damage that his fire dragon flame missile calls and how effectively he used it. She couldn't make a slip up with him. Tsunade, who had still on the Okage robe, but removed the robe and threw it to the wind. She was now wearing a slight variation of her everyday outfit. The difference was her gi, which was now blue and long sleeve with a white waistband. Also, her heels were treated for the sandals that were worn uh, universally by every shinobi. Another thing that was visible was the first Okage's necklace around her neck. Aisu was glad she was finally taking this seriously. He too removed his robe, revealing a black sleeveless gi, held together by a red sash, black sweatpants, and matching color sandals. Both warriors were now ready to take it up a notch. Sanjuro was trying to figure a way out of the barrier. The sealing techniques that he tried weren't working. He knew that the only way to free himself from this technique was to have to unseal it from the outside. He cursed himself for acting on impulse. He couldn't even protect her. He would have to sit and watch. Though Shinobi holding the barrier, and Icy better pray he doesn't get free. There's gonna be a hell to pay. On Buu Central Tower, Ibiki was standing on the balcony with a few Jonin and Shunin under his command. It was like the sound invasion all over again, but this time it seemed to be much more than they could handle. He was watching as three summons headed towards the village. This isn't good. A Shunin landed next to him. Sir, it seems that Shinobi had penetrated far into the village. Civilians are being evacuated, but... The Anbu squad are having trouble because they are fending them off and, well, they can't focus on the civilians. About half have been evacuated and the other half is still in transportation. I suspect it would be a slow process, but by the time we can counter-strike, it's going to be too late. Where are our allies? Ibiki asked. All over the village and outside of it. Sir, what do you want me to do? Nothing. We have to hold that iguana, hedgehog, and that crayfish at bay. Direct all of your attacks there. We could really use Sasuke's or Sakura's summoning ability but I assume they are doing what they can, and we have to do what we can. Get ready, Ibiki looked at his men, and then at the incoming animals. This was going to be a very, very long day. Ibiki and his group headed out, inside the village. Makin and the other Ninin were trying to get them to the stone-faced monument undetected. From where they were standing, battles between Shinobi from the Leaf and other villages were taking place. He knew the dangers of Shinobi life, he even read about wars. But to be in one, and the danger associated with it, was exciting and scary at the same time. Holding Hayami's hand while running, he looked back at the girl. Don't worry, we're home free. 
Makanu turned back to face forward only to come to a dead stop. Him and the other Genin were cut off by Kumoko and the group of Rain and Rock Shinobi. Ranpu, Makanu, Okuru, Yasumi, Futeki, and Yogan lined up side by side with Hayami and Yumi behind them, forming a wall. Kumoko spoke. Well, it seems that I got you now. I'm going to enjoy this. She took a step closer, but Konohamaru and his friends appeared in front of the Genin. Konohamaru, who was standing in the middle, addressed the Genin. We got this, and you guys get out of here. Konohamaru, you're okay. I'm glad, Hayami said in a relieved tone. Well, Sasuke is the reason behind that. You go on and get out of here. Ranpu didn't hesitate. He grabbed Yumi and Makanu grabbed Hayami, and they were gone. Komoko went after her, but Konohamaru cut off her path. Sorry, but I still owe you for those kunai on my back. Her eyes narrowed. I'm going to kill you. He slipped into a fighting stance. Be my guest. The other six shinobi from Cloud were in front of the remaining four chunin. Hanabi activated her Byakugan. Una was now in his fighting stances, along with Matsuri and Moigi. Hanabi was not going to play around. She knew Konohamaru was good, but that lady was a jonin, and she had to be good. She would utilize her jukin to its fullest and get rid of them quick. Matsuri threw a kunai that set off the battle. Hanabi was battling two shinobi, one she took down fairly easily. Poor guy didn't know about the jukin. The one who engaged Moigi yelled to his comrade. She's a Hyuga, try to avoid her strikes or you die. Hanabi appeared behind the shinobi that was warned. Too late. She aimed at his back with an open palm. She had intended to send Shocker to stop his heart, but he quickly avoided much to her surprise. So, you're faster than you look. Good, at least this will be interesting. Hanabi went on the offensive. Konohamaru was not doing so well against Komoko. She was far better than he thought she would be. He underestimated her, something he regretted doing. He dodged a kick in that his head was unsuccessful with a punch that sent him crashing into a nearby building. He jumped up immediately, but instead of Komoko, he encountered one of the two shinobi that Udon was fighting. Komoko, who was on the opposite building, laughing at the situation. Take care of him, okay? Yes, ma'am. When he told her he would take care of him, she left the scene instantly. Konohamaru knew that he couldn't give chase. This ninja in front of him would make sure of that. Makanu, Ranpu, Akuru, you're on your own. Give it your best. Konohamaru readied himself for the incoming attack by the Cloud Shinobi, Yuga Compound. The Yuga clan wasn't having much problem fending off the attacks. There were too many shinobi attacking them, though. It seemed as if it was planned this way, while all the other Hugas were doing respectively well, with a few incurring minor injuries. Yashi wasn't doing too well. He was facing off against a cloud shinobi that seemed to taunt him at every turn. I don't know why you Hugas are so revered. You're all scum. When Lord Aisu told me I would be in charge of the division responsible for attacking and the extermination of the Hugo clan, I was more than thrilled. It's because of your former head that my father was killed. He's talking about Gashira, that's his father. He doesn't know I wasn't responsible for his father's death. Fate is cruel. I killed his father, and now he stands before me, maybe even stronger. No, this kid is weak. I'll prove it. Hiyashi slipped into the Jukin stance. Roba laughed. You think you can beat me with that? You won't land a hit to do any damage, that much is certain. Hiyashi ignored the kid. The reason being, he was within range, slipping into position to perform a Hake Rokuju Yonsho. Roba jumped into the air and shot a few fireballs at Hiyashi. The Hugo was forced to perform a Kaiten to parry the attack. When Hiyashi came to a stop, he searched for Roba. He saw him coming from his backside on the left through his Byakugan, but he didn't have enough time to dodge. When Roba went to strike, a foot in his jaw sent him a short distance. Instead of landing on his back, he pushed off of his backhand and landed to see the one responsible for him not claiming Hiyashi's head. The one who stopped him was a young Hyuga girl with a loose-fitting beige v-neck short sleeve shirt and black spandex with matching colored sandals. Hinata's hair was blowing in the wind as she was standing in front of her father. Hiyashi wondered what she was doing here and how come he didn't see her. All he saw was something moving so fast that he couldn't register who or what it was. What are you doing here, Hinata? I'm sorry I wasn't here earlier, father, but I have things that I needed to do. Are you okay? A concerned Hinata asked. Yes, stand aside now. You can't take this guy on, he's too strong. Hiyashi said he to step forward. He wasn't expecting her to cut off his path. Sorry, father, but you can't continue. I'll take it from here. Rest, father. I'll do the rest. Hinata, I said move aside. How can you? Hinata spoke in a calm manner. I can win, father. Just watch. I'll show you how strong I truly am. Hiyashi was hesitant, then he decided to see what she had. Whatever. Just don't die. Robo laughed at the girl. How noble. Protecting your father, but no matter what, he'll die. Right after I kill you. Hinata took the jugged stance. 
I won't underestimate me. You and your group attacked my family and you almost killed my father. I will not show you any mercy. I never expected mercy from you, Roba said. He figured this fight would be much easier than the one he had with Hiyashi. How wrong he was. Hinata didn't waste time. She performed hand seals at a rapid pace, a pace so fast that Hiyashi was a little surprised. Hinata performed the fall surrounding Genjutsu. The area changed to a desert land, from Roba's point of view. He didn't know where the girl was. Not to worry, he thought, a jutsu of this level wouldn't work. Pulling a kunai from his holster, he slashed the area on his right side. A thin line formed in the invisible area, causing blood to spill from it. The attack caused the genjutsu to fade. Roba had to block the palm strength that came from Hinata, who now had a thin cut on her cheek, but he blocked it at her forearm, avoiding the palm thrust. Hinata followed up with another strike, but this was avoided as well. Roba created distances between him and Hinata. Plunging his hands into the ground, a stone wall rose up in front of him. Doing more hand seals, the wall broke up into sharp pieces of stone. Earth-style, flying stone dagger. The daggers of stone flew at Hinata. Instead of doing chitin, she shielded herself with Shugo Hake. Robo was almost expecting her to do that, so he could use that time to get within striking distance. She had surprised him greatly. He wasn't worried, he believed he was faster and stronger. When all the stones were deflected and Hinata stopped her jutsu, he said, Well, it seems you're not like the other Yugos I've encountered. You're actually good. Hiyashi was watching Hinata in awe. Sure, she won against Hanabi, but he never saw her like this. Not even in her battle with Hanabi. His daughter was good. Really good. That's something he knew, even when she didn't. He blamed her mostly for her mother's death because of his own inability to protect her. He saw his beloved wife in Hinata so much that it pained him to even look at her. She took everything from you, Yuri. Your looks, your gentle nature. Everything she has is from you. When she was first born, it was one of the proudest days of my life. I saw greatness in her eyes, but I was a little disappointed when she wasn't like Nenji, a genius among geniuses. I was a little envious, so I pushed her, but you told me to ease up. She would become a wonderful shinobi, and I did, uh, believing you were right. His eyes softened as he watched out the battle. You were strong, but I have myself to blame for that, I suppose. After you were killed, I was much harder on her, and I didn't understand why I hated her so much. I started hating her to the point I blamed her for your death. You're probably ashamed of me right now. I know, so am I. Every mistake she made, I made her feel worthless. When Anabi was old enough, I just ignored her completely. But no matter how hard I tried, whenever I looked at her, it was your eyes staring back at me. I thought I would get over you by sending her to her death by taking mission with that cubie brat. I even thought relegating her to the branch house would make it right, but it didn't. She did something I never thought she would do. She fought back. A small smile formed in his face. And like you, she finds solutions to problems that others overlooked. I missed out so much on her growth because she reminded me of you. In the process of trying to shut you out, I shut her out. A major piece of my heart. Watching our daughter now, it's like I'm seeing her for the first time. The way you always saw her. The way I should have saw her. Please forgive me, Yuri. And please forgive Hinata. Roba decided to end this little battle between him and Hinata. The girl was good, but he was better. Not wasting any time, he appeared in front of her and slashed her throat with a kunai. She avoided by ducking, but the end tips of her hair had gotten severed. Pulling on a kunai of her own, she performed an upward slash that was ultimately blocked by his kunai. Having the advantage, he aimed a kick to her head that connected. Skidding on her back in the dirt, as soon as she came to a stop, she propelled herself up into a backflip by using her hands to push off the ground. She felt the pain in her cheek. That kick really hurt. She wasn't underestimating him at all. The fact was, she saw the kick but couldn't react to it. Hiyashi saw the cut in her cheek and her newly formed bruise on the other. He was about to step in but Hinata yelled out, Father, I said let me do this. Please. He saw the pleading look in her eyes. He couldn't help but hate himself more. She was doing this to prove herself. He was about to speak but she cut him off. Don't interfere, father. I'll win. Just give me a chance. Hinata pleaded. She didn't know if he was listening to her. Her father was hard to read. When he nodded, she had her answer. Alright, I'll refrain from interfering, regardless of what happens. Thank you, father. Hinata got back on her feet and wiped her lip. The much taller cloud should now be addressed, Hinata. You know, this reminds me of the Minashu genocide. I can see it. It's going to play out the same way. It won't go the way you want it to go. I'll make sure of it. She still had an ace up her sleeve, and she was going to reveal it. Widening her leg stance, she brought her arms together in an X shape with her index fingers extended. 
Kiyoshi was slightly surprised to see what she did. He hadn't seen these seals in years. So, she has gravity seals. Interesting. A purple outline of aura traced around her body. The purple seals were now exposed. In a matter of seconds, the seals faded. He had to form the hand sign to make the shadow clone. Here's a trick I picked up from Naruto. He had to create three clones, which moved quickly to surround him completely. Not really impressed, he looked at the clones and the girl. So, you seals, and now you can create three clones? whoop de doo You failed to understand what I just did. Those seals don't give me power. They are gravity seals. Gravity seals? The expression on his face illustrated that he had no idea what she was talking about. Hinata explained. Imagine this, if you will. What happens if you fight someone you're normally equal footing with? So, what happens if they are wearing weighted clothing? The answer, you have, uh, the advantage. But if they remove that weighted clothing, he finally understood. You mean? Yes, that's the general idea. With my seals on, you had a small advantage. But now that they're off, you have no advantage. He not to inform the surrounded shinobi. Don't get cocky, little girl. I'm still in control. All four Hinata slipped into the Juken stands with the Byakon activated. Actually, you're not. You failed to realize that you are now within range. She's in position to rip him apart with Kaiten or perform the 64 palms. She has the advantage. Hiyashi was right. Hinata would use a combo that would end everything. She watched as Roba looked around cautiously. Not having time to react, the Hinata behind him used Neji's empty palm, knocking him off balance. The Hinata on the right used this opportunity to perform the 64 palms, 2 strikes. 4 strikes, 8 strikes, 16 strikes, 32 strikes, 64. She used an open palm on the last strike to send him to the clone on the left. Robo couldn't feel his chakra. What the hell, I can't access my chakra. That bitch. He didn't have much time to complain because the Hinata on the left did a flip and was now standing on her hands. Using her arms for power, she pushed off and planted both of her feet into the man's back, sending him upward. Robo felt the pain all over. All he managed to do was look at the clone that was behind him and the original Hinata who was in front of him, apparent both his left and right. With a look of panic in his eyes, he started to plead. Don't have mercy. Hinata wasn't listening, she said. You fought well. With that said, she performed the chitin. Grinded between both chitins, all that could be heard was his screams. Coming to a stop, Hinata made a slow descent to the ground. When she landed, all of her clones dispersed. Resting on one knee, she was breathing slightly heavy. Only a few seconds after landing, Robo landed a few feet away from her. Laying on his back with his eyes and mouth wide open, it was evident he was dead. Hiyashi looked at Hinata. She's even stronger than I am, but how? Did she always have this power? Hinata saw the shadow of the approaching person. When she turned around, her father was looking at her with an unreadable expression. She knew that expression too well as she put her head down. He hates me for showing my skill. Here it comes, he's going to scold me. Hinata was proven wrong for the first time. Hiyashi offered the girl's hand. Hinata looked up to see that he had still had the same blank expression, but something in his eyes had changed. She didn't know what it was, but whatever it was, she was glad. She accepted his hand and he pulled her up. When she was standing completely, Hiyashi spoke. That was a good combination. You've come a long way, Hinata nodded. I guess, we still have to help the others though, he nodded. Right, let's get going. About to take a step to go to the other section of the compound. They were surrounded by Shinobi from Rock and Rain Village. Hiyashi looked at Hinata. Looks like we have more to take care of. You take the ones on the left, I'll take the ones on the right. Okay, father, just don't push it, okay? You're still injured, Hinata said with a concern. The same could be said about you. Whatever, don't worry. Just show them uh, why you're the clan head's rightful heir. But I thought Hinata was cut off. Yes, but you still haven't forfeited your position to be heir. Just because you're not a shinobi of the leaf doesn't mean you're not a Hyuga. Hinata was surprised by the small smirk that formed on his face. I know that's your way of saying you're proud of me, father. I don't know what brought the change, but I'm glad. With the boost in her confidence due to her father's acceptance, she stepped forward. Father, you rest. I'll handle them. Hiyashi wasn't expecting this, but seeing what she did to Roba, he couldn't argue. Okay, just show them why the Hyuga is the strongest clan. Hinata nodded. One of the rock shinobi spoke. Hey, stop ignoring us. We came here to kill you. Hinata was smiling. This baffled the shinobi. She wasn't smiling as it taunted them. No, she was happy. Her father had accepted her and showed her some respect. She was truly happy. I'll make you proud, father. You too, mother. Hinata took a fighting stance. Now that she had his respect and his attention, 
She would make sure she wouldn't lose. She would make him proud of her, smiling. I'll make you proud, father. Somewhere in the village 15 minutes later, the six Ginnin ordered to get Hayami and Yumi to safety were moving closer to the location. Not long now and we're home free. Ron Pu, who was holding Yumi, yelled up ahead. Watch out! The kunai that came from the left was aimed at Maknu. He jumped over the kunai and watched them pierce the ground below. He landed with Hayami still in his arms. He put her down and pushed her behind him. All the Ginnin turned to their left to see Komoko standing a few yards away with a slight smirk. Finally, I caught up to you guys. Just hand those two over and you won't get killed. Makanu shook his head. No, we have a mission and we're going to complete it or die trying. He readied his hand next to his holster. Ronpu realized the situation. They were going to have to fight. There was no way around it. He whispered to Yogan uh, so he could hear him. Yogan, that technique you use at the exams. How long does it take to generate? About a minute or so, why? He asked wondering why he was inquiring about this information. Akuru, Makanu, and I are going to set her up near attack. To do this, she can't see it coming. If she does, then it won't work on her. She's a Joni, and the only way we stand a chance is working together. Yogan saw through his plan. Okay, but what about Yasumi and Futeki? Don't worry about them. They're going to be on the offensive like us, so the only one who really needs to know and pay attention for when the opportunity presents itself is you. I'll give you the signal, okay? Ronpu stepped closer to Makanu. Komoko directed her comment to Ronpu. Formulated a plan, I see. Think it's going to work? He shrugged. Who knows? Want to give it a try? She was going to enjoy killing them to get to Hayami and Yumi. Ronpu glanced at Makanu, then at Akuru. The two understood the meaning in that look. Yasumi and Futeki on the other hand were confused. Makanu spoke. Futeki and Yasumi, hang back for a sec. Let us handle this, okay? Ronpu was kind of low on chakra, but he figured if he could just hold out enough to get her into position where Yogan could perform his jutsu, they would be okay. Doing something that Futeki never thought Ronpu would do, he rushed at the lady. Kumoko was waiting for him to get close, but when he disappeared, she wondered what he was planning. When Akuru, who was obviously behind Ronpu, appeared in front of her so suddenly, this did catch Kumoko off guard slightly. Using her speech, she swatted Akuru to the side. Seeing Ronpu behind her, she kicked him, sending him reeling back. They gave Makanu the opening he needed. Appearing under her, he placed a kick in her chin, sending her upward. Kamoko wasn't expecting that. I took my eyes off of him. I underestimated them. That Hyuga kid, he was probably counting on this. He'll be the first to go. Makanu appeared behind. You saw it once, now you'll see it again. Sorry, but there will be no third time. Kamoko disappeared from his view. Makanu's eyes widened. What the hell? Everyone was looking up at Makanu. Ronpu was sure that she had underestimated them so much that they could catch her off guard with Makanu. Feeling someone behind him, he jumped away to avoid the kunai. He wasn't so lucky. Komoko managed to cause a large gash across his torso. Ronpu fell to his knees, holding his stomach. That was now covered in blood. He glared at her. Shit, I could have been killed if I didn't react fast enough. Even though he was in pain, it was well worth it. He glanced at Yogan, who was on her right. Komoko turned to see Yogan with his hands together, smiling at her. Lava consumes all. The ground started to shake underneath her violently. Soon after, it erupted, engulfing her in it. When the geyser of lava died down, uh, Yumi stepped forth to help Ronpu. Are you okay? Somehow, but we still have to get you guys out of here. Ronpu was happy that they tricked her. At least that was done, or so he thought. Looking at Hayami, whose eyes widened while looking at Yogan. He turned around quickly to see Yogan get hit by an incoming kunai that pent him to the wall. Kamoko was standing on a building laughing at their failed attempt. Did you really think I would lose so pathetically, Hyuga? It's clear you're the leader of the squad, but since you and that kid over there with the kunai on his shoulders are so injured, I guess these guys will do. Makanu stepped up. Don't underestimate us. The battle isn't over yet. He appeared in front of her, kicking at her head. This was blocked effortlessly. He appeared again on her right so fast that if it was a Ganyin, it would have connected. But since it wasn't, it was blocked and followed by a punch that sent him down to the floor. Poteki watched him cough up blood when his back hit the ground. Going through hand seals as fast as she could, she performed the grand fireball. But it was overrated by water bullets. Then actually put out the fireball and it hit her dead on, causing her to pass out because of the impact. Before she passed out, she whispered, Makinu. She fell unconscious. Yasumi grabbed a kunai and stood in front of Yumi and Hayami. I'll protect you with my life. Akuru appeared next to her. We won't let anything happen to you. Komoko took a step towards the group. That's not nice, you know. How can you two make a promise you can't keep? It doesn't matter. You'll die with them. 
Yumi looked at Hayami. She grabbed the girl closer to herself. Don't worry, Hayami. I won't let anything happen to you. What about you, big sister, Yumi? I don't want anything to happen to you. The girl didn't want her to get hurt. Yumi placed a hand on her shoulder. Don't worry about me. It's my job to worry about you, okay? Komoko was going to enjoy this. She was getting closer, but Makinu appeared in front of her with his arms expanded out. This is as far as you go. Ronpu was still holding his stomach. Makinu, it's suicide. Shut up. We have to fight until we can't fight no more. I said I wouldn't let anything happen to the girl and the lady there, and I meant it. You're gonna have to get through me. Makinu reached into his pouch and threw a handful of shuriken at the lady who knocked them all away with the kunai. Makinu attacked Komoko. He was giving it his all, and she could see it. Every punch, every kick, and no matter what he did or the variation in which he did it, all were completely blocked or dodged. She was getting tired of the senseless battle. A Genin battling a Jonin. It was laughable. Sidestepping his punch, she chopped him in the neck, causing him to land at her feet, smiling over him. Komoko kicked him so hard that he skid across the floor. He came to a stop when he placed his kunai on the ground. Yumi looked at the boy who was about 20 feet away. She might not have been a ninja, but she knew he couldn't take any more. Ronpu was injured, Futeki regained conscious but couldn't move, and Yogan passed out from the pain in his arms. Looking back at Hayami to see how she was reacting, she saw the little girl's hand on her sword. Komoko turned her attention away from him, ignoring him completely. Her attention was now on Hayami. She continued to walk towards the girl. This caused Yasumi and Akuru to tighten their perimeter around her. Getting closer, the girls gripped their kunai tighter. However, their grip slightly loosened when Makinu appeared in front of them again. Komoko's eyes narrowed. You again? You must really want to die. I'm surprised that kick didn't kill you, kid. I told you already. I'll protect them. It's my mission. Plus, I gave my word I would. That was it. He had pissed her off. Komoko punched him hard in the stomach, causing him to double over. Raising her foot high, she planted it in the back of his head, sandwiching it between her sandal and the ground. She grinded her foot on his head. I'll start by killing you since you want to die so much. Komoko jumped back, avoiding a kunai from hitting her head. Futeki was using everything she had to stand. Get off of him! Komoko watched the girl fall back to her knees. She focused her attention back to Makinu, but he was no longer in his previous position. She turned to Hayami, only to see that he was in front of her and Yumi. Blood was coming from a number of cuts on his face. He was barely standing, but Komoko couldn't help but see that look in his eyes. It was a look of never giving in. Most Shinobi would have broken already, but this bastard kid didn't. Even if his friend knew it was suicide, why didn't he? That look did make it fun for her, though. His type realizes when they're near death how hopeless it was. I love that look. Can't wait till I see it on him. About two dozen shinobi from cloud, rain, rock, and mist surrounded the Ginning group. A male cloud shinobi spoke. Komoko, we are under your control. Special request from Cohen. Okay, but hang back for now. I'm having fun, she said with a sick smile. She raised her hand above her head. I'll kill you with this jutsu. I wanted to torture you, but I won't get the chance. Oh well, too bad Big Brother Naruto isn't here. Yumi pulled Hayami close. Yumi pulled out the kunai Naruto gave her. I don't know if you can hear me, but if you can, Naruto, now would be a good time to show up. A big crash was heard throughout the village. Everyone felt the shockwave on the ground. Komoko and everyone turned to the direction of the big crash. Yuga compound. Hinato was standing next to her father after feeding the last of the shinobi. Many shinobi lay dead, both from the enemy side and the Hyuga clan. Holding her father up as she walked towards the house, both turned towards where the crashing sound came from. Both looked on with bewilderment in the village, Sasuke and Kodan landed on opposite roofs. Well aware of the other, the two turned to the source of the crash, Sasuke smirked. Show off. Other side of the village, Neji smirked at what he saw. He spoke into his mic. Do you see it, Iron Fist? Lee responded. Yes, I do. Perfect timing, wouldn't you say? Neji responded. Perfect indeed, in the woods. Naya was defending herself against a number of shinobi, but a smile graced her face. I couldn't have done it any better, outside of the village. While waiting for the Mizukage to arrive, Kaito was happy to see what he saw. This should be interesting. In the stadium, Kakashi looked on the cause of the crash. Kakashi thought, You are your father's son. Just when the situation looks hopeless, you show up in the nick of time. I was starting to lose faith that you would make it in time. Under his mask, he smiled. But I never doubted that you wouldn't come. In the ring, Shikamaru, Anko, and Tamari, who had joined them earlier, were all glad at what they saw, Shikamaru especially. Uh, troublesome guy. On the roof above the Okage's observation deck, Tsunade and Aisu were a distance away, both resting on one knee. 
I used to watch the calls for the crash. What he saw caused him to say in his head, uh, the wild card. Shinari was shocked, happy, and mad all at the same time, but she was glad. I knew you would come. In front of the stadium, standing on the head of a toad were two figures. One was a female and the other was a young man with a black bandana with orange ends on the top and bottom. This matched the black track jacket with an orange collar and bottom. Black sweats and sandals made up the clothes, but the two swords, one in his hand with the blade resting on his back, neck, and the other, with the angel wing cross guard rusted on his back in its sheath. The outfit was now complete. Looking down and scanning the area, the male spoke. It seems we're a little late for the party. I see a lot of Suna, Leaf, Waterfall, and Grash, and I'll be dead. Far more than from the enemy. Well, I guess we better lend our hand. What do you say, Rin? The male asked. I say you should have worn the cape that I gave you, Rin said while pounding. Still mad over that? That's too old-fashioned, Rin. Besides, I'm sure it's been done already, Naruto said. It still would have been cool, Rin whispered to herself. Are you ready, Rin? Naruto asked, bringing her back from her thoughts. Rin nodded in agreement. Let's go, Naruto. Hokage Monument. Cohen was sitting on top of the monument. When he saw Naruto and Gamabunta, a smirk formed on his face. Welcome back, Naruto Uzumaki. He was glad the person he waited for was back. It wouldn't be long now. One thing was for sure. Naruto was in the leaf once again.